All right, our next guest is a former NHLer who came oh so close to winning a Stanley Cup in 91, but some guy that wore number 66 out of Pittsburgh kind of got in his way, uh, but transitioned well from playing to the finance world and and full disclosure uh, disclosure because Stu Gavin is someone that uh, I've been working with for the last 20 years and uh I still think it's remarkable that uh I entrusted you because I'm I'm used to the Greek way where you find a soft mattress and a couple of pickle jars and you hide your money. <laughs> yeah. But let's bring in let's bring in Stu Gavin. Uh, I thought it'd be a, a good idea. We thought it'd be a good idea to bring you on Stu. Uh, there's there's a lull in the Evander Kane, but that won't stop people from still wondering um, how a guy like this or many other athletes in general find themselves making millions of dollars to filing bankruptcy. So, first of all, thanks thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, Kipper and Justin. Uh, good to be on. Uh, all right. I mean, where do you want to start? Because I'll, I'll tell you, uh, you know, and I want to be full disclosure here, um, you know, you had first started transitioning out of professional hockey into in a uh, investment world. Uh, you made a few phone calls to me. We we had known each other, but not not a whole lot well. And you know, my first thought, Stu, like many of my teammates back then, is, you know, you're asking me a lot here. I'm working my ass off for every dime I I. I I got I want to protect it Uh, it's hard for players to kind of entrust people with something so intimate as as their money correct is it still a challenge all these years later is that the first process is actually players giving up their money and entrusting people Uh, absolutely the trust is huge and I think um, you know having someone that can relate to that player their experience and uh, what their experience uh, has been or will be. Uh, As you know, uh, invariably, I'll uh, try to reach out to younger players. They might be prior to their draft or once they're drafted, and, you know, they love playing the game. They want to pursue the NHL, but there's a business aspect of it as well. So not unlike their hockey, they have to train and get better and stronger, and they have trainers and nutritionists and different coaches around them to for them to realize their goals, I think it's paramount that they have someone that uh, obviously is trustworthy but uh, competent, has the accreditation and and the resources behind to deliver it, and and obviously can relate to uh, what their journey may be like. Well, Stu, this is one of the fascinating things for me is you know uh, Kipper mentioned it off the top. Evander Kane managed to um, you know squander a, a lot, a big contract, a lot of money that he hadn't even made yet. And for me, I wanted to understand how these players access their money they don't deposit their checks in a checking account and withdraw money at the atm uh, when they need it what are some different ways that players approach being millionaires young i I mean i assume some guys get sort of an allowance or a monthly sort of a per diem from their own money how how does this work well it's it's a great question and it's different but i know for us it's really setting up targets for the people that we work with um, you know, setting up targets, you're constantly educating and informing the player, and you have to do it in in small enough amounts so they get it and that they are engaged in the process. But you know, quite frankly, a lot of times you, you don't want to have you know tens of thousands of dollars in a bank account that should be you know moved over to a different account, ideally an investment account where it's maybe. Um, not noticed and there's not that urgency to go and spend it. But um, I think the, uh, you know, budget is key, but then also for an athlete, once they get in the league, they invariably think um, that it's going to be a long journey and that they're just the nature of the beast. We're invincible They're, They can do anything. And so the fact they might get hurt or they might get cut or that, that they, that the career might be shortened, um, they have to think that way and and uh, kind of plan accordingly. But as it relates for the the cash flow and the decisions, um, you know, I think I think it's uh, set some targets. Not like they do it for their training and for their season. Um, you know, save every paycheck. Just put some money away. It's out of sight, out of, out of scene. It's working for you for the day that you don't play, and then ma- and manage and live on what uh, is kind of allotted to you each each month. Stewie, I had teammates uh, when I broke into the league that. Uh, 
could wouldn't know how to pay a visa, wouldn't know how to book a flight. Um, is is it better today? Are the players more inquisitive? Are they are they um, focused a lot more than just playing the game and leaving it to others? I mean, again, my, my teammates wouldn't even have a clue who was double dipping on their fees. Not a clue. Yeah, yeah. So um, the the good news that there's more with the more money, there's more people involved. And at an earlier age, uh, whether it be the agents, whether it be the families and just the, the dollars that are there, that uh, there's more resources, even the internet and even the player association and different people um, trying to make the player aware of uh, the situation to manage it, to make good decisions. Um, um, So, so that's, that's a good thing, but you know, Kipper, you get to the NHL, you know, there's a card game in the back of the plane. You want to play. Everyone wants to win, so maybe you try to gamble a little bit more. And the first thing you know, and I've seen this, guys will lose a paycheck playing cards in the back of the plane. And, uh, and you know, it's... So then do they come uh, to you and, and ask for more money? <laughs> yeah. Well, we've had calls from Vegas or, you know, the Vegas the next day or guys texting some of my staff to say, you know, pay the marker off for 50 grand from last night. I, I didn't have a good night. And I think, um, you know, that that desire to win sometimes uh, they don't understand the risk they may put themselves in is, is something as simple as gambling and not setting limits, you know. So that's uh, that's that's um, that can be an issue. So how tightly then do you work with them as, I don't want to say a babysitter, but like I'm familiar with the story where an NHL player bought a house for a family member and got fired by his, his money manager. So this is not part of the plan, not what I wanted to do. If you're not going to follow what I you know think you should do with your money, it be, you know it's not going to work. Is that common? What is the relationship like there? Well, uh it happens a little bit, but uh, again, most of the players, most of the players that uh, in the league are, um, what's the word, respectful. Um, there may be some financial literacy, or their family, or, or someone trusted is close to them to help them learn and make those decisions. And we work with a whole, with it could be a family member or um, that other could be the agent, whoever else is involved in in the team that the player has around them to uh, allow them to maximize their, their uh, success. So um, for the most part, the guys make good decisions. Um, and when you're young in your career, Hey, you're going to make poor decisions or you're going to regret maybe buying a certain car or whatever. I think of something as simple as buying a sports car in a warm climate. And then two weeks later, you're traded to Winnipeg and you need snow tires on the, on the Corvette. <laughs> so, you know, little things that, like, geez, I shouldn't have bought that or I can't use it, but, but, Hopefully they're small and you learn, and life's about learning, and then um, and then trying to make sure that what's important to you. And for us, it's save, you know, put money away every paycheck, and then um, over a, over your career and over a long period of time, that compound effect, um, you know, it should be a, a larger bucket, and hopefully you maximize that success that it allows you to transition from your hockey and have some money and resources there or in some cases the guys that are quite fortunate to never have to work they'll do something but they don't have a, a financial need to, to work but that doesn't Stu, how many to many players how many nhlers you represent uh we probably uh north of uh 60s 60 to 70 players and and then retired players majority of our client base um are uh, have a hockey background, um, summer in management, um, but uh, um, and that's that's uh, that's the core of our business. We also deal with other people that have um, you know wealth and that need to need a, a game plan and need a trusted advisor to help them along make make decisions. So I'm sure the pendulum swings from like say me an example who would be like an A plus student to. <laughs> To, to like some really guys who are just awful still with their money. Um, so my my question to you is, as a as a president of, of of your wealth management team, is it hard sometimes to look at a guy and and say, 
you're you're still heading in the wrong decision or in, in the wrong direction. And there's got to be a is there ever a point in time when you go like short term gain gain? I'd like to keep your fees, but long term, it, it's put it this way. I wouldn't be I wouldn't want to be the financial advisor uh, to have on my resume. Uh, yeah, we handled the Vander Kane uh, file, you know, for for 15 years. You know what I mean? So are there are there, yeah. are there clients when you got to say, I, I have to fire you, not the other way around? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think the, 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 um, you know, the, I said this to different players, they don't need another friend. They don't need someone to just say, yeah, go do it what you want. You know, if they articulate that these are my goals and it's to have set themselves up for, um, hopefully some financial security, if they articulate what's important to them and then I see them not doing it, then we have another discussion or you have to, Tell them point blank, you can't do this or you should not do this because it's not in your best interest, short term or long term. And I find so often the advisor may, to your point, fear of losing the client or losing that revenue will try to, you know, accommodate the the person or accommodate some of their bad habits. But you need to have those tough um, discussions with them so at least they're clear to the implications of, of their decision and and that's a big thing um really try to tell the players if you do this this is what can happen and conversely if you make some uh, a couple of poor choices and sometimes one poor choice it can have a dramatic effect on your financial life long term and that could be buying a house um you know we get traded you buy a house because um you don't think you can find a rental or you know there's pressure to, to have a house um you know that could cost cost you, you know, millions of dollars if if your career doesn't uh, pan out or you're not in that city for any length of time. Well, and these are competitive guys who you know I, I don't want to say they live on the edge necessarily, but they they can be risk takers. You know, do you do you find that you have clients uh, in the NHL who want to do adventurous, aggressive things with their money? I, I think they get approached by a lot of people to invest in restaurants or to you know put their money here or money there. Is it more common for these guys to want to do other things with their money? And at that point, do you do you have any sort of input on that, or at that point, it's up to the to the client? Well, we we do, and we have a lot of uh, dialogue, and I think those opportunities do, do come along. I think they come along um, um, fewer times than some people might think. But when they do, you know, our role would be to uh, whoever is presenting the offer to put it in writing, see if it's valid. Sometimes it may be valid. And then the next question, if it, if it checks the boxes, um, really what amount of capital could the player allocate to this? And, and if it goes and does well, great. But if it um, tanks and they lose their money, it, that dollar amount will be insignificant and it won't materially change their quality of life. So those are the discussions we have. And, and it's a great learning opportunity, um, some of these opportunities, because the player then says and, and would hopefully agree, no, I don't want to do this. And they might see that person bring it to them as the benefit is more for them than it is for the investor. Stu, there's been a salary cap uh, for quite a long time now, but it's almost as if sometimes uh, you listen to the players, and I'm not sure if they still understand it uh, or, or the escrow. Of course, you uh, uh, and your whole uh, management team have to be on top of that uh, all the time. But he, here in, in Ontario, when it comes to, the say, the Maple Leafs, uh, and, and people say, oh, you know, Jack Campbell's going to sign for $5 million or $6 million, uh, or a player's making a million – how much are they truly taking home these days? And yeah. mm-hmm. it's nowhere it's nowhere near the amount that, that looks sexy in a newspaper, is it? No, that's it. When we even a simple um, um, document we'll put together, and that's here's your gross salary, and everyone reads that in the papers, and the guys are making X, X amount, millions of dollars. But, um, you know, when I first turned pro, uh, a guy told me, and actually Terry Martin was the least. He, he said, "Hey Stu, it's not what you earn; it's what you save." And and we all see what's on our paycheck. But for uh, NHL players today, with escrow and the deferrals, and you know, um, and with taxes, depending on what jurisdiction, 
they are at least 50 percent. In some cases, it could be, you know, 70 percent of that gross is gone. You know, it's, it's a high, high number. So if someone thinks that they are signed for four million or five million, they're getting that five. Obviously, um, there's a lot of friction on that from different sources uh, that uh, there's a lot less goes into their bank account that they can now plan and manage for their future. The average player that you deal with when they're done their career, are they, you know, I think a lot of us think they're set for life or is this for, for players now? It's just sort of a, a chunk of their life and they still got to get out there and, and, and earn. Um, yeah, another, everyone is different. I've seen some players that, you know, make, um, you know, a relatively smaller salary compared to their teammates and their percentage of savings is a lot higher. And you can get a, you know, a third line guy that plays, you know, 10, 12 years and just kind of socks away each year and is, doesn't live large. And he will do a lot better than that person that makes twice as much and decides to live large and treat his friends and have an entourage and, and just, uh, you know, live for the day rather than the future. So, uh, but to be really set up, I think at a minimum, the guy, guys, if they have a, you know, if they play four or five years or however long and, and uh, they can save and maximize that opportunity, at least gives them a pool of money to transition and maybe they can go back to school or maybe they can, you know, uh, maintain a lifestyle until their, their second career or post-hockey career, the income and the opportunity can grow so that they don't have to tap into those resources that they, they saved and worked hard to save. So it's, uh, um, it's, it's different. But, hey, uh, you mentioned Evander Kane. I don't know the man, and I just see what's been written and publicized. Obviously, there's some, uh, a lot of gambling issues. In those cases, we see players that maybe are uh, self-destructing will reach out to the PA or the agent and try to mm. get them the support that the, the professional um, support they can have to deal with the addiction or the, the health issue that they're faced. It looks like it's financial, but invariably it's something different. Stu, we've seen countless of athletes uh, in other sports uh, blow fortunes. Evander Kane will go down as uh, the biggest one in hockey, but let's just generally speak here. Uh, and we saw another case where Jack Johnson, I think, uh, declared bankruptcy, uh, you know, another ugly situation. But generally speaking, is is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Can can players like this dig themselves out of this or is it just a foregone conclusion that they're going to work the rest of their lives for creditors? Um, you know, I guess in in certain situations, that'll there'll be a, a bankruptcy court or they'll go to go through a bank, bankruptcy process. And then it, uh, the, the, those terms will dictate uh, um, what creditors uh, they're obligated to and for how long. But um, I think, you know, if uh, I've seen different players, uh, they, they would come to us and want an assessment and just say, Hey, where am I? Am I on track? Because invariably they don't know. They, they, they make decent money. They think they're saving some, I remember one case, a player I, I, I talked to, and I asked him, how much do you, how much do you spend each year? You know, oh, I spend a lot. You know, I go, well, well how much? I must be at least, you know, 400 grand a year. And I looked him straight in the eye and said, you, you spend 400 grand before you even get out of bed. And he looks at me. I said, I know you have two houses. I know you're, you know, have multiple cars and you, you, you know, you, you know, you have a, an expensive lifestyle. And I also knew that his salary, his agent fee alone was about three fifty. So there was no way that he was spending that much money, and and it was significantly way higher. But at least then he knew. And now you can come back to a plan and say, what is reasonable? What do I have to do to set myself up? And and um, that's where some of the players that make a lot of money can spend a lot. But uh, it's, I think it's absolutely critical that. They have a plan. They have targets. The great thing is athletes generally are very coachable, so you can coach them and set goals. And for us, it's like um, minimum savings targets each year. We really have three numbers I think are really important. And it's not your body fat or Corsi score or any <laughs> of the other stuff, but, but it's, it's really, um, you know, what's your budget? What's your minimum savings target for that upcoming season? And then how much you have to save throughout your career to never have to work. 
So at least the player can go in, go into that season. He'll know his budget, and we track that each month. He'll we know going in, you need to save I don't know seven hundred thousand dollars, and then we track it each month, and we see at the end of the year, did you exceed it or not, and then why? There'll be a reason for it, but that targets there, and then they also know, hey, if I get you know, so many millions that I never have to work. And it's interesting because some of the players will take that into their negotiations with the agent and say, with the team, I know if I sign for three years for this or four years and get this number, then I'm set. So they can, it's, it's, um, it gives them the comfort and they have their own targets to, to set themselves up. Because Nick, you know this, we know this, all the former players, when you're done, you know, if you haven't taken care of yourself, no one's feeling sorry for you. It's your fault. You should have done it. And uh, there, there's no handouts. So um, um, you, it's really important you do it when you have the chance and you have no regrets. None. None. And uh, I made one of my best financial decisions in 1997 when I handed you $92.78. And, <laughs> and today it's well over uh, $1,100. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I love helping hockey players. I know how hard it is to get there and and the commitment they make and the sacrifice they make along with the families. And then, you know, to get in, even to stick in the league and stay and, and have a career. And then, quite frankly, all the predators and creditors and, and people that are trying to be in your pocket and looking at the athlete as a, a meal ticket for how they're going to do well rather than, um, what can I do to help that player? And and uh, and that's where the trust side comes in. And I think it's so important that you know, for anyone listening, and and uh, you know, have credentials. Um, you know, you don't just need a, a nice person. You need someone that has the horsepower and the credentials to do it, and the, and the organization. And ideally, if they're a fiduciary, meaning they have to you know, always act in the client's best interest, is good. But there's so much financial literacy that people generally um, aren't aware of. And, and I encourage them just to do lots of due diligence just because someone says, I've got a guy and, and I really like him do, do more due diligence. Cause um, you've seen it with other athletes. They all go to someone they really like, but that person is abusing now, not just one, but a whole group. Fascinating stuff. Uh, Stu Gavin, uh, really appreciate your time. He is uh, president uh, at Gavin Hockey Wealth Specialists. Uh, look him up. Uh, take a look at uh, the website because uh, there's a there's a lot of uh, a lot of strategies that go into this. And uh, uh, keep up the great work, Stu. Really appreciate it. 